the absolute rule of the state is a function of the absolute liberty of the individual, but that cannot happen until there is a collective worldwide gnosis. And I know this sounds a bit utopian, but I'm telling you, it is definitely possible. Hey, it's Illuminostic, and in this video, we're going to take a look at the emergent global chaosrophy through the lenses of ancient Egyptian mythology. And we're going to do this not only because ancient wisdom is not necessarily taught or generally understood in a way that really conveys its true value, but also because, as we all know, there are patterns in history that repeat. And I think that an examination of these patterns can help to inform us and in this case, uh, allow us maybe to even kind of predict the ultimate outcome of the transitions that we're experiencing. So do me a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe. Please do support us on Patreon because that is what allows us to continue to make videos. Incredibly, this mythology is just as relevant today as it was at the time of the Egyptians' own plague. A lot of ancient cultures, possibly because they existed for much longer time periods than ours, uh, observed great cycles. The Mayans had the long count year of 26,000 years. It was based on the procession of the equinoxes. Um, the Egyptians had the reign of gods. The reigns of these different gods actually represent modalities of consciousness. As we will see, every equinox there is an emergent new modality of consciousness, and I'm suggesting in this video that we are on the precipice of one such uh, transformation. There was the matriarchal period where the feminine was kind of the focus of the culture and uh, the focus of worship. The calendars were based on lunar cycles and then uh, eventually we moved away from that around the founding of the time of Egypt towards a solar based kind of worship and a patriarchal uh, not only religious orientation but also um, in our government we tended towards the, 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 the masculine and the solar. These patterns that are being described by these ancient cultures are uh, expressing through all systems and throughout all of time. And of course, because they're so large, we don't, there's absolutely no way we can have a um, instrument to measure them. They're not very observable, but I think the fact that maps have sort of been made in these old mythologies kind of indicates that these are repeating patterns. But what these cycles imply is that we can actually rely and trust that the eventual integration of the necessary consciousness will be part of an organic process, a collective gnosis. And so Osiris was the god that defined the period of the founding of the Egyptian Empire. He was a powerful, benevolent, and just king, or god king as it were. But eventually, at the time of the equinox of the gods, he had become archaic and blind. And why is that? Um, he was the ethos of the empire, which we could also think of as culture. And culture is basically a construct of the dead. It's the baggage of our ancestors. And this is one of the main reasons, I think, and one of the reasons that this uh, ancient mythology is so poignant at the current juncture is that uh, generational dissonance is a huge problem and a very difficult thing to reconcile. To see through the eyes of the culture of your ancestors is to sort of see the world through corpse goggles. Um, the dead are not living, they're not evolving, they're not breathing, they're not changing in the United States. Uh, the old ethos is indeed dead. Uh, Osiris was um, democracy and freedom and independence. And of course, you know, the United States at this point is uh, one of the most heavily regulated. Surveillance is in incredibly tight. All of your information is consumed by government and corporate agencies. And the people are in total denial about this. So what we see in, uh, in, in, in in the public at large right now, with the, the tendency towards um, cognitive dissonance and selective perception and uh, research that is basically entirely based on uh, confirmation bias, is these things are actually coping mechanisms. And the reason that we have um, gravitated towards this sort of artificial surface level uh, interaction with our worlds is that it it makes it easier uh, if you don't have to be honest with yourself about what kind of person your child might be or who their friends are and you don't really want to know your co-workers in a tremendous amount of depth <laughs> you only want to deal with things as deeply as it is required of you in order to function in our society and I think that this has had basically calamitous effects and we have become a very um, sort of shallow, vapid, despondent kind of culture. And in this mythology of Osiris and Horus, uh, I think that we have um, 
a real clue to the antidote to our situation. Back to Egypt. So what happens? The body of Osiris, which represents Egypt and all of its provinces, have been scattered. The empire cannot be unified. There is chaos. The malevolent influence of his brother Set and the willful blindness of Osiris have decimated the empire beyond any hope of reconciliation. Chaos, which is embodied by Isis, uh, who is Osiris' wife and the queen of the underworld, becomes aware of the dismemberment of her husband, and so she comes up from the underworld, and it seems as if she is going to reign. She has usurped the throne, so to speak, if temporarily. She roams about the land seeking to reassemble the body of her fallen husband, Osiris, but she's only able to find his member. Eventually, she becomes impregnated with the seed of a new order, the new god, the new aeon, a new modality of consciousness. The child, the lord of the new aeon, the crown and conquering god Horus, as a bird of prey, he is endowed with far greater eyesight than our own. He soars above everything and so procures a higher perspective from his lofty elevation far above our own acutely limited visa. He is not blind like his father and so he can be victorious because he knows what he is up against. He does battle with the malevolent force of the old Eon, Osiris' brother Set, and during this battle he loses an eye. This happens because confronting evil directly often damages our consciousness or our perception. This at least partly explains the willful blindness that we see in society. People are not inclined to take this risk. And so, emerging victorious, Horus travels to the underworld where he is reunited with Osiris, or the traditions and the ethos of the old eon. He gives Osiris his extracted eye, so that his vision may not only be restored, but revivicated by integration with the new consciousness and the higher perspective of the younger god Horus. And thusly conjoined in vision and spirit, they return to Egypt, the land of the living, to rule together. The corollary with our current predicament seems almost too obvious to bear elucidation. America and the rest of the world is at just such a spiritual crossroads. The necessity of the old guard to integrate the new consciousness into their blind, dead, archaic, and misguided traditions and institutions has never been more obvious. Uh, a ruler needs to have the qualities of the combined Horus and Osiris, and uh, certainly the current election where we have Donald Trump versus Joe Biden, uh, we don't have the potential for that in our leader. And what I learned myself when I was doing this, the research and contemplating this stuff to make this video um, over the last couple of days, I, I had gotten to the point where I just wanted to see the whole entire system burned to the fucking ground. I've just, I've had it. But after contemplating this mythology, it occurred to me that it may actually be possible to revive our own Osiris with new sight rather than to abandon him in the underworld. We uh, can do in the face of a total void of any leadership that represents uh, the new consciousness. We have to become the embodiment of Osiris and Horus in ourselves in the country that I come from in the United States, um, at least in this election cycle, there is absolutely no hope that we are going to have a leader that really represents the kind of consciousness, the kind of forward thinking anarchistic um, tendencies of this new uh, paradigm. I think the real value in the Gnosis is that people that experience these spiritual awakenings, they come to serve life as their God. Uh, and it's an organic process. It's not the same as ascribing to some old uh, uh, book of rules of ancient date designed to make us all feel great while we fold, spindle, and mutilate the unbelievers from a neighboring state. Thank you, Frank Zappa. Um, <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is along those lines. We're not trying to conform to a set of ideals. Uh, when you have these experiences and you have the direct knowledge, the gnosis, that... We are all truly one soul, divided for the sake of union. When we know that any individual that we're interacting with is but our reflection, and who are we to judge or strike them down, we don't need to be governed any longer. And I know for a fact that there is a constituency of powerful people that actually actively work to suppress this kind of consciousness. We do not have... Uh, an aristocracy that is trying to cultivate the highest potential in the masses and really see the greatest 
uh, expression of human potential come to fruition that is uh, humanly possible. They could cultivate that. I know how to do it. Aleister Crowley knew how to do it. Rudolf Steiner knew how to do it, you know, 150 years ago. One of the ways that Crowley and Steiner both advocated this could be done was to allow children to determine their own subjects of study from a very young age. And recently studies have been done that have confirmed that is absolutely correct, that the um, herd conformity, you know, stuffing the child into this mold, uh, universal fit, is not the best way to uh, bring the best out in a child. And so this type of education should be relegated to the dust bins of history. It should become a ghost of the old aeon. These people definitely know about psychology. They know about human tendencies. They have access to, you know, all of the Ivy League research that you could possibly dream of. If they really wanted to engineer a culture that represented the best of humanity, that's what they would do, and they do not. So we have to stop looking to the leaders to do this for us, because at least for the time being, it has become clear that they are not going to let, at least in the United States, anyone anywhere near a seat of power that has the objective of actually cultivating this illuminated um, society. So thanks a lot for watching. I hope you got something from this video, and just keep the faith order out of chaos and we don't really know for sure which way it'll go is the new order going to be that based on the kind of consciousness that we see emerging in the collective now or is it going to be a new order in the sense of absolute control this new world order kind of oriented fear-based uh paradigm um i personally feel that one way or another this more evolved um high vibrational consciousness will take a seat upon a throne and take the scepter and the eon of horus will be the eon where the absolute rule of the state is a function of the absolute liberty of the individual but that cannot happen until there is a collective worldwide gnosis and i know this sounds a bit utopian but i'm telling you it is definitely possible and i think that we have the tools at our disposal to actually effectualize the changes so hit the like button share subscribe support us on patreon and thanks a lot for watching